Okay, good Friday morning, everyone. Uh, as always, I'm so happy to be here with you today uh, as we continue this journey that we started three and a half years ago, um, learning about the ins and outs and left and rights and ups and downs of our backyard ecosystems. Also our front yards, our side yards, the skies, the dirt, uh, and in case of today's talk, sometimes the insides of our houses as well as the outsides of our houses. Um, I think it was Larry who said this has become the backyard naturalist and beyond. Um, and today we're we're bringing to the forefront a creature that's mostly in not in the forefront, in the rear front, because this is a creature that you usually don't see uh, until you move something. That's if you want to if you want to see an earwig move something, um, because it's probably under something, and uh, uh, it's it is of course the earwig. Um, I know they're in my house. I know they're outside of my house. They're probably in and out of all of our houses. I'm not and have never been weirded out by them, but some people really, really do. It's this, it's this, uh, maybe it's a strange body plan that evokes, uh, like sometimes with spiders and and some of the other many legged creatures that really just kind of make our, our brains go, what the heck is this? Um, but, uh, they, they, they don't bite, although they certainly look like they could do damage to you. They really can't. Why are they called earwigs? What are they? Um, so that's what we're going to look into in episode four of season five of the Backyard Naturalist, the big earwig. And while this slide is up, if you haven't seen the movie, The Big Year, you should. You should watch it. It was an absolute box office flop. I mean, I think it lasted in the theaters for about a week and you wouldn't think so with, with such big, big name stars in it. Um, but it, it certainly has a cult following. It's a fun movie. And if you just need a laugh, um, watch it. You'll be glad you did or rewatch it. Uh, any movie with Steve Martin is usually, in my opinion, uh, worth it. And like PBS, we'd like to thank all of our viewers, whether you're watching this on the UEC YouTube channel or you're here with us live. Uh, and I just want to give another shout out to everyone that is a current or past or future or had thought about becoming a Backyard Naturalist subscriber. Your support is so appreciated and necessary. Uh, for us to continue to provide these weekly learning spaces that I personally value immensely. Uh, we've got a really fun slate of upcoming speakers, uh, monthly field trips. I hold this time sacred um, simply because I get to hang out with some great people. So thank you for being here. Speaking of field trips, the first trip of the season will take place next week, Saturday at 1 p.m. at Washington Park. So this Sunday, in, in a couple of days, I'm, I'm giving a, a doors open field trip called the Natural History of Washington Park. Um, and the, the trip is full, but as a subscriber, you can join the following week for free. Washington Park has a, a very rich human history that goes back thousands of years. And we'll, we'll take a look at the, the complex history of the land, as well as efforts to restore parts of the park to its pre-European state. Or, or something similar to what it would have looked like before Olmsted. And, and in this case, the story is going to be told through mainly through some trees. Um, and, and so, yeah, before the land was platted and sold and divvied up and changed, um, uh, it, it probably looked a little bit more like, like some of the restoration areas. This is might be one of my favorite places to explore and I hope you can join me. And also, again, the Urban Ecology Center runs a small eco-travel program. Excited to bring you locations for the upcoming year again. Uh, Amanda put together a wonderful trip to Southern California in late February. Um, and uh, all of the places that we're going to explore are new and an absolute mystery to me. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to explore these areas, especially with Amanda. Her, these are her stomping grounds, and she's going to share them with us. We do have a few spots remaining for our return to Ecuador and the Galapagos next April. Uh, this is one of the most magical places I've ever experienced. Uh, I'll replay, played this last week, but I'll just replay. It's a very short promotional video. All of the photos you see were taken by participants on the trip last fall. Uh, so here we go. <laughs>
Um, so we'd love to have you along. I'm also just going to show a very short snippet. Oops. Um, this was uh, this was a video not taken by myself, but I was right here. I the, the, I didn't have a, a GoPro camera, but but Carlos was right next to me when when he took this. So this is just a just a few seconds here. You can see what snorkeling in the Galapagos is like. And uh, the the wildlife really just comes right up to you, turtles, uh, sea lions, penguins. If you're interested in learning more about the trip, um, we're Carlos is going to lead an informational session, uh, virtual one, uh, next week, Wednesday at 5.30. So if you want to see if this is maybe the trip for you, um, you can join us uh, for the virtual session and decide then. And then again, we're heading back to Costa Rica next August for our first uh, fully wheelchair accessible trip. Um, and accessible to folks with mobility issues. We're partnering with Il Viaggio uh, and Costa Rica Rainforest Experience, which are both wonderful local organizations that specialize in sustainable and accessible travels. So if you're interested in any of these trips, I'd love to talk about them. I promise we're getting to earwigs, whether you want to or not. Some of you probably would prefer that I, I stall a little bit more, um, but there's also some exciting news related to uh, space and space exploration, things we can see from our backyards. Um, to start with, we are entering my absolute favorite time of year, which is autumn. And so if you have a, a regular mammalian sleep cycle, the actual equinox will occur probably when you're sleeping tomorrow morning at 1.50 a.m. And that's when the Earth will be at its midpoint between the solstices and equinoxes are the great equalizers, uh, meaning that all points of the planet, no matter where you are, you'll receive 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of no light uh, or night, uh, except if you're at the poles. If you're at the poles, the sun's just gonna make a victory lap uh, exactly at the horizon at both poles equally, saying uh, either, hello, here comes the light for the next six months or see you later, the light's leaving for six months. A um, Little bit of space news on in October of 2020, uh, back when the Backyard Naturalist was in season two, early season two, uh, a spacecraft from NASA called OSIRIS-REx got up and close with a near-Earth asteroid called Bennu, and it uh, it picked up some samples of rock and dirt. So in, this is a photo of the the spacecraft land the spacecraft landing and then kind of uh, popping up all of the debris. It was able to capture some of that debris. Then later, it successfully left the asteroid, took a long journey back to Earth. Um, but on this Sunday, the spacecraft is going to be close enough to Earth that it's going to jettison the capsule that has over a pound of asteroid parts uh, scheduled to, to land in Utah at a test range. And then uh, it'll be available for us to, 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 to basically research. We're interested in, in this particular asteroid for a couple of reasons. One being the fact that this might this is one of those asteroids that might pose a small danger of colliding with Earth, um, but not over, not for at least a century. Um, and but secondly, we believe that this asteroid is rich in carbon uh, and could hold clues to the beginnings of life on Earth. Um, maybe help us better understand the origins of our universe. So, hopefully, that will land safely. And um, that mission is ending. But then we're we're doing another asteroid mission uh, on October fifth. NASA and SpaceX are going to launch the Psyche mission. In this case, they're going to be visiting, for the first time, uh, a metallic asteroid that's located between Mars and Jupiter. Um, they, they believe that it was once part of a planet, and the planet is called Psyche, that broke apart. Um, it's going to take six years to get there, but uh, this will be the first metal object that we've ever visited which we think might might have a similar makeup to the center of the earth, kind of a, a nickel iron rich uh, environment. So we, we're never gonna be able to visit the center of the earth probably, uh, but we are gonna be able to potentially see what the center of the earth might look like. So, and then finally, um, there's a mission by the Indian Space Research Organization, which is a, a launch of a module, a test launch that could bring uh, astronauts to or biomonauts to the moon and to Mars. And the spacecraft is called Gaganyan. 
Uh, and this is a, essentially the the final test run of of everything except the humans. So it's going to be the the human capsule, uh, send it off into orbit, and um, and then hopefully if all goes right, that'll be one of the many uh, in this race to get humans back uh, into Mars and and or back to the Moon and to Mars. Um, so we're going to see this all unfold over the next few years. So so hang on. Okay. So now on to earwigs. Um, obviously, the first thing for me when I see this body plan is 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 those pincers, those those forceps, uh, kind of coming out of the butt. Um, I imagine that's the first thing that most people notice when they see it. Um, I also think that maybe one of the reasons that we freak out is that it just looks kind of a little Frankenstein-y. Um, I'm I'm a little like the head really looks like an ant to me. If you look at and you see some of these pictures, the head looks so much like an ant, but then it kind of looks like it's um, part part cockroach, part scorpion, part I don't know. It just looks like a bunch of things put together. Um, they're very fast. I don't think we like that um, because of something fast might get out of our notice or 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 we we think it try to get onto us. Um, so. The, the this this earwig journey is going to start with um, the question that we usually start with: What is an earwig? And it's an insect, um, and we've we've had a lot of insects in these series. Um, but in this case, when you refer to something as an earwig, you're talking about an entire order of insects, all their own. Uh, you know, I, I thought of the earwig as maybe like a couple of species of like like a, a species of beetle or something, but it's 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 its own entire order. Just like we have butterflies um, and ants, so it's a it's a whole group of insects, not a species. Uh, it belongs to the order Dermaptera. Uh, it's small. There's only about two thousand species in this group. Not like the beetles that have just millions and millions, uh, the billions, trillions, quadrillions. It seems uh, Dermaptera means skin wings, so derma makes sense. It's skin. And wings. So then, you know, what does that refer to? And that refers to um, they have wings. That's something that uh, kind of maybe I knew, but I didn't realize. And not only do they have wings, they have beautiful wings. Uh, so the order is named for these wings that are kind of membranous, very delicately folded under their four wings. So uh, they have wings and they can fly and they're in fact their entire order is named after these wings um, that are kind of membranous like skin uh, so uh, you, the other thing that you'll notice in this group are those those uh, forceps on their abdomen also called circe um, and they're mostly nocturnal they like to hide in small moist dark dank places during the day um, so of course, if they're doing that during the day, that means they're active at night, but that's okay. Cause we're all sleeping. So, uh, Dermaptera is the Greek origin for the Latin grouping. Um, but then the real question, why earwig? So earwig comes from, it's a, it's got an old English, uh, root. This might surprise you. Ear comes from the old English word for ear, uh, as in the body part and then wig also Old English means insects. So the the first clue we have for why they're called earwig is that it's ear insect, um, but still why? And then from here, there's there's two, two kind of popular explanations. So if we look at those wings again, uh, that we hardly ever see because they hardly ever use them because you know we don't, we're not there when they're active. Uh, the suggestion is that the wings, when unfolded like this, resemble a human ear. And sometimes, depending on the species, they might even have the color of of at least some some cultures' uh, skin. Um, most likely, uh, you know, European in this case, and that that kind of domination in in the in the market. Um, so, the unfolded wings resemble a human ear, and so that makes sense. Um, as a hypothesis for or why they're called earwig. Uh, but more likely, 
it comes from an alternate hypothesis, which comes from an old wives' tale that earwigs like to crawl into your ear. And not only do they want to crawl into your ear, they want to crawl into your ear so that they can get to your brain so that they can lay their eggs. Um, I can tell you categorically right now, earwigs do not seek out your ears and they do not lay eggs in your brain. Um, they're at least not any more than any other insect. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes you hear stories of a, a mosquito or a tick or, or something that just gets into your brain. Um, but there's no, there's no tendency for those insects to be more earwig than not. So this is not part of their life cycle. Um, there's no reason for them to want to get into your ear. I think it'd be, have to be pretty random circumstances for that to happen. Um, but the anecdotal reports are amplified or made up. Um, and then, uh, that the, it continues. So it makes a great story but not going to happen, not going to happen to you. Uh, but once an old wise tale begins, it, it gains steam and, and we believe it. In fact, this particular story um, probably came back from 2000 years ago, good old Pliny the Elder, uh, who suggested that this is uh, what your wigs do. And if you want to believe him, he also pointed out that uh, you should put goat poop on an open wound if you want to prevent rabies. So, um, you know, Oh, I should do a, well, anyway. Uh, so earwig either refers to the shape of the wing um, or to the thought that they would burrow into your ear. You decide which one you like better. I think I'm gonna stick with the laying eggs in your brain. Uh, makes for a better story. Around a campfire. Surprisingly, of the 2000 species of earwigs, only one is believed to be native to this part. Uh, at least those of us here in the northern U.S. and Canada. Only one native one, that's the spine-tailed earwig, Doru aculeatum, um, and probably because very few earwigs can survive winters in cold climates like we have here without the aid of, of human habitation. Um, so the spine-tailed earwig hides in crevices during the winter. Um, they'll actually hide in the leaf axis of emerging plants. Um, one of the reasons that earwigs are so good at hiding in small places is that they have this body type, this flattened, elongated, small body plan. Uh, the, the pincers are at the back of the animal, the rear of the animal, whereas a lot of times if, if they've got something that they want to be threatening, it'll be at the front. But, you know, this is an animal that's crawling through dirt, crawling through small places. And if it had those at the front... Um, it'd be a lot harder. So now they can kind of just drag them through these small crevices. Um, the largest species of earwig is only two inches long. Thank goodness, maybe a little bit longer with those Circe at the back. And right now, this is the world's largest earwig species at two inches long. So um, at least the world's largest extant species, they're, they're extinct species that were much bigger. This is the Australian giant earwig. Titanolabus colisea. Um, there was a larger earwig in, in recent times uh, studied by modern humans, which is the St. Helena earwig, uh, Labudura herculeana, and it lived on the island of St. Helena, which is about halfway between Africa, South America, and the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, very remote um, it was a it was a large earwig that lived in these deep burrows and would come out at night to forage among uh, sh uh, shorebird colonies, and uh, it was a likely food source for the Saint Helena hoopo, also called the giant hoopo, which was the world's largest hoopo. Um, but unfortunately, after many of the birds, including the hoopo, went extinct because of the activities of human sailors, um, we also believe that the earwig is also extinct, probably because the community on which it depended was radically altered. Uh, and then there's also these non-native predators were introduced. There have been many expeditions to find this earwig. Uh, it, I think since like 1960 or so was the last time it was seen. Um, and all of those expeditions have failed. So it's, it's uh, thought to be extinct. So no more four inch earwigs around. Um, but excellent time to to quickly talk about maybe a future backyard naturalist topic which is island gigantism which is a 
a phenomenon that occurs when um, in which the size of an animal or plant species, if they reach an isolated island, if, if, it, they're, if they're small to begin with, there's a chance that they will dramatically increase in size in comparison to their mainland relatives. Um, so the tree in this slide is actually a, a species of cucumber. Um, but and and then the the um, the giant crabs. But interestingly, if so, when small animals colonize, they'll get huge. You also have the case where if you have a large animal that reaches an island, they will actually shrink. Um, but this is this is probably why Saint Helena had the largest earwig in the world and the largest hoopoe in the world and and some other very large creatures. So. Uh, the next big question on my mind after why they're called earwigs was what is the deal with those pincers on the rear end? Can they bite me? Can they sting me? Um, and it turns out that those Circe are are kind of are multifunctional, um, in, including the things you'd probably guess they would do. So they are used to capture prey. Uh, they are used to defend themselves. Um, they're also used in courtship and um, so you have sexual dimorphism. The cerci of the males are more curved and the females are more straight. Uh, males will kind of, if, if there's a battle for a territory, they will kind of put their cerci together to compare size. If they're equal in size, you might get a battle. But if one is much bigger than the other, the, the smaller one might just say, all right, you're, you're going to win this battle. I'm going to leave and, and spare both of us the effort and potential uh, chance to be harmed. Although uh, fights between males rarely uh, it results in any kind of injury. Uh, in an interesting uh, kind of, uh, you know, move away from the normal, uh, a lot of times in the animal world, symmetry is favored. Uh, so whether that's sexual selection or anything, symmetry is favored. But in the case of earwigs, uh, an asymmetric pair of pincers is actually favored both in battle um, and both in in sexual selection, that's it's favored uh, by females. So, uh, just an interesting kind of um, move against the normal. Uh, so, the the Circe are also used, and we're going to see this a little bit later. Um, those wings, those wings, boy, they are crazy delicate and folded up. And after they pop out, they need to be folded back in. Um, so if you, if you go back and watch the ladybug episode, uh, you see that in the ladybugs, it's very similar to the, to the beetle format here. So they have those four wings that are small and leathery and aren't used in flight. And they're able to kind of protect, uh, just like the elytra and beetles, they're protecting the flying wings and the flying wings are super delicate. And, um, so the, the Circe are used to help them kind of get that once the wings are out and huge to kind of fold them back in origami style and to get them back in. So they're, they're kind of a multi-tool. Um, and I'm, I'm still shocked that earwigs can fly. It's very rare for them to fly and they're not the best flyers, just like beetles. Um, and, but they have that similar morphology to beetles. Uh, another thing that comes to mind when I see an earwig is that they don't look like your typical adult winged insects. Um, to me, they kind of look like they're always in a juvenile stage, probably because their adult form resembles their juvenile stages uh, of of both their own and of other insects. So they they kind of remind me of a of a, a larval dragonfly um, in the adult form. They don't kind of have that typical adult insect form. Um, so they 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 undergo incomplete metaphor metamorphosis, and essentially after they hatch. To us, it appears as if they're just simply growing with each instar. Uh, not not a whole lot of changes from larval to adult forms, at least not that we can see. Uh, so depending on the species, four to six molts or instars, their life cycle runs probably about a year, again, depending on the species, and they just get bigger. So uh, again, just they're they're always a little bit off of the normal path of evolution and, and, and adaptation. And, and again, that's probably one of the reasons why we are creeped out by them. And right about now is uh, in the fall. They're, they're starting mating and courtship. Yes, there's courtship. Um, and I promise me, I promise you, 
uh, that you're going to like this part, probably. So males and females will stay together after mating through the autumn and into the winter. So they are paired up just like your swans that you love and your geese. Uh, you got your, your pair of um, earwigs that are living together, that are hanging out together, that are taking care of each other in their in their dark crevices um, in, in your house. So that's pretty cool. The pair stick together. So you can see the male is on the left, the female is on the right. You can see the difference in, in the Circe shape. The males are more hooked and the females are more straight. Um, and they hang out until the female kicks the male out, which usually happens right before that she's about to lay the eggs, uh, which is kind of late winter, early spring. But they spend their winters together. That's pretty cool. Uh, then early spring, She'll lay a clutch of about 50 of these beautiful white eggs, probably in your backyard, um, near your compost bin, uh, somewhere around the dirt. There are a couple species of earwigs that give birth to live young, but this is another part you got to love. Earwigs are one of, one of the only non-social insects that show maternal care. So she doesn't just lay her eggs and leaves. She lays her eggs and she stays with them. Uh, she pays very close attention to her brood. They're vulnerable to fungus. So she not only cleans them to get the any any potential fungus off them, she also has a little bit of antifungal uh, chemicals in her saliva. she she will actually provide them with warmth. Um, you know, they're not a mammal that can that can um, that has, you know, um, metabolism, but uh, just like any kind of closed space, if you if you're able to kind of, close it in and get the air inside, you can actually protect them from cold. Um, so she's continually cleaning them, protecting them from intruders, which you know probably is gonna be another earwig or, or something else that wants to come eat them. She is able to identify the eggs as her own uh, by scent. So the earwig is, is, uh, is, has strong maternal care. Um, and then when they're ready to hatch about a week later, she stays with them. She assists, she helps them to hatch. She she assists them with that and helps them to encourages them to eat the eggshells. Um, and she continues to watch over them, continues to protect them. Uh, and then, um, oh, and she will also regurgitate food for them to eat. So just like just like those penguins that you love that will regurgitate food for their babies, um, mom earwig will also regurgitate food for their young. So uh, they'll continue to live with her um, under her protection all the way until their second molt. Um, and then if that's not enough, if, you know, straight out of the giving tree story, um, if she dies during the stage, she continues to give to them because they'll eat her. Uh, hopefully full of gratitude for all that she did for them. Um, and if, if, uh, if times are tough, sometimes she'll just lay there and let them eat them, uh, eat, eat her. Uh, so very, very loving, very giving mom. The young then become independent, continue to grow with their final instar. They become adults. And this is when you you see the the adult forms, the, the differences in the Circe shape. Um, this is when their, their wings become functional. Uh, they develop their natural color. They kind of go from that, that white egg to to the adult um, brown or black color depending on the species and um, as is the case with many insects they will continue to eat their former exoskeleton that they molt out of to retain nutrients as adults uh, they eat a wide variety of living and dead plant and animal matter depending on the species they can become agricultural pests particularly the the introduced species um, and particular in crops like corn. Uh, there are a couple of instances in human history where they reach what you would call plague level. And that's all, all, always this non-native species inside of a house um, to the point where they're like covering the floor, but extremely uncommon. Um, and for defense against predators, they, they can wield those intimidating looking Cersei like a scorpion. Um, and a couple species will actually emit a foul substance uh, that is said to smell like battery acid out of their abdomen as a spray to deter attack. Because there's a lot of things that want to eat earwigs also. 
but for the most part during the daytime when we're up and and about they're just hanging out and um again i usually only see them if i have to move something they're usually under things uh occasionally you'll see them on walls or ceilings and if you do startle them they will scurry away very quickly also creeps us out um but they're attracted to damp areas like near your sinks or your bathtubs it's much more likely though that they're hanging out outside your house um under a planter uh you know any any place you have like like a compost bin they really like those dark spaces lots of food to eat um and you know, another really important thing for us to celebrate is that there's no evidence that they transmit any kind of diseases to humans or livestock. Um, uh, even those those nasty looking pincers are essentially harmless to humans. So even if you tried to get them to, to latch on and bite, from what I've heard, read, is that they're not even going to hurt any more than, than those uh, green darner dragonfly pincers that um, Maggie sometimes gets exposed to. So... The most common earwig that we have here now in our homes is not the native one. It's it's a it's the European version, the the common earwig earwig, Forficula auricularia, and um, depending on the circumstance, this can be a pest, uh, or it can be good for agriculture. So if they're destroying your crop, it's obviously a pest, but they've also been known to eat a lot of aphids and uh, other potentially uh, harmful organisms to, to your backyard garden or to your crop. So, um, yeah, depending on the circumstances, depending on what you want, they can be harmful or helpful. Um, and a lot of the information that you get when you start to look for earwigs comes from, um, pest control companies like here the pest dude and all the weird pest names they have um, that try to to capitalize on our fears and say you got to get these things out of your house uh, humans do have a long complicated relationship with earwigs so if, if you've read james joyce it's a common theme in their work uh, finnegan's wake and ulysses in particular in finnegan's wake one of the characters hce stands for humphrey chimpton earwicker which is a reference to earwig. Uh, Oscar Cook wrote a short story called Boomerang, which was adapted by Rob Serli Rod Serling for not the Twilight Zone, but for Night Gallery, a TV series. And there was an episode called The Caterpillar in which an earwig was used as an instrument of murder to drive somebody insane because, of course, the murderer understands the biology of earwigs. It was actually a jealous husband, I believe, and, and their tendency to lay eggs in the human brain uh, in fact, many of the cultural media references of earwigs in poetry and prose focus on the connection with earwigs and the human ear. So it makes for good stories. And Roald Dahl takes a slightly different approach in, in the book, George's Marvelous Medicine. So George's grandma tells George some very important advice uh, and, and quoting from the book, a big fat earwig is very tasty but you've got to be very quick, my dear, when you put one of those in your mouth. It has a pair of sharp nippers on its back end, and if it grabs your tongue with those, it never lets go. So you've got to bite the earwig first, chop, chop, before it bites you. Um, and a little while back, uh, I was talking to someone who said, wait, you're doing earwigs. I thought you already did earwigs. Um, we we haven't done earwigs yet, but there was a program on silverfish, and it's it's very common for people to confuse silverfish and earwigs. Um, they both kind of occupy a similar niche inside your house. And again, you usually see them because you move something and you're surprised to see them. And they're both very good at scurrying away uh, in, a, in a similar body plan. But the two are about as closely related to each other as uh, a squirrel would be to like a manatee. They have they're completely different orders, different diets. Silverfish are smaller. They live longer. Um Silverfish are almost exclusively found in your house where earwigs are more likely to be found outside your house. But again, they can also be inside. Um, there's a lot of other differences and um, you can go go back and watch the episode Silver Fishing Playbook uh, to, to kind of cement those differences in your brain, assuming there aren't already earwig eggs in there.
So that's the earwig, a wonderful, doting, and fierce mother that doesn't want to harm you. It's 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 happy that you've provided it some nice dark crevices for it to live out their lives. Um, they can't hurt you. They don't pose a threat to your home, despite what those Orkin websites say. Um, in fact, they probably do more good in cleaning things up for you, uh, both uh, living and non-living organic matter. So next time you see one, um, maybe fight the urge to go and run away. Um, take a closer look. Look at the Circe. Is it a male or is it a female? Um, where is it at in its life cycle? So what is it fall? Is it about to, to mate? Um, is it spring? Is it about to lay eggs? Uh, maybe pick one up. Um, it can't hurt you. You can maybe see, try, try the pincers. I think the common earwig that we have uh, isn't going to spray you with anything. And you can marvel at how that head looks so much like an ant and appreciate them as a successful insect and a loving mother. But I can't end quite yet because I'm really still focused on this whole part about the wings and the flying because that's just blowing my mind a little bit. So um, it, it's not just that they have wings and they can fly. That part alone is pretty cool. But it, they have some of the most complex wings in the entire insect world and, and even in the entire animal world. And uh, National Geographic recently put together an amazing video that I'll, I'll show you in a second. And it's it's a and there's a story about how incredibly complex those wings are. Um, they're so intricately folded, uh, but they use simple and complex physics and arrangements. They When they unfold, they unfold the 10 times of their folded sides because when you look at the adult, those the wings that they're folded under are very small. And then they, they come out to this huge uh, flying wing and they lock into place. There's no direct muscle activation in there. It's all the physics of folding. Um, it's like a pop-up tent or uh, those those pop-up soccer goals that you just kind of pull out of the case and they just pop into their place. It's very similar to this. It's it's all that that passive movement, um, and and it uses tension to lock into place. And so this is really uh, just a, a a gold mine for engineers that are studying this um, because there's a lot that they could learn in terms of of human tools. Um, and so um, I, I can't show this on the YouTube channel for copyright reasons, but I, if you're watching this recorded, I encourage you to go to the National Geographic website and search for um, earwig origami, maybe ear, earwig origami wings. Uh, watch the video, read the article. I'll share the links with you all too. Um, so this is gonna be our moment of Zen. Uh, for those of you watching recording, this is where I'll sign off and I'll say thanks for watching. And for those of you watching live, we can watch this short and amazing video together. So thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. And I will...